This is Reaganism, a podcast dedicated to exploring where the Reagan movement lives today. I'm Roger Zak. I'm your host, director of the Ronald Reagan Institute in Washington, D.C. On this episode of Reaganism, Roger speaks with Professor Michael Boskin, Tully M. Friedman, Professor of Economics, Senior Fellow, Hoover Institution, Stanford University and former chairman of the President's Council of Economic Advisors. Roger and Professor Boskin discuss the ongoing battle over our country's debt limit and budgetary spending, and the downfall of Silicon Valley Bank and what it means for government regulators and consumers alike. Dr. Michael Boskin, welcome to Reaganism. My pleasure, Roger. Now, you are the T.M. Freeman Professor of Economics and a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution, previously served as a 15th chair of the President's Council of Economic Advisors from 1989 to 1993 under George H.W. Bush, and really our thought leader and expert in all things economic policy. Uh, so excited to, to have you here, Michael. Before we jump into the issues of the day, for our listeners and viewers out there, give us a quick snapshot of what it means to be the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors. It sounds like uh, pretty important and someone who's talking to the president a lot about the state of the national economy. Well, that's true. I mean, that the uh, influence of the chair of the president's council of economic advisors, the whole council, including the members and staff, depends quite heavily on uh, your relationship with the president, because the only formal obligation under the act that established the council is to produce the economic report of the president, which is done annually and expresses the president's point of view, the outlook of the administration on the economy, and then a variety of important aspects of that that uh, seem important to, to weigh in on. Uh, so that's the formal obligation, but the, the, the council is represented on all interagency task forces. Uh, uh, we even sometimes are included in the national security materials, depending on what's being debated. Uh, and if you have a good relationship with the president and you make sure that when you speak in these meetings, you're speaking consistent with the, consistently with the president's point of view, and you've explained these issues before you uh, go off on your own. Uh, you can have a quite strong internal influence and be an important uh, external advocate for the approach of the president. So there have been many that have been quite influential, others uh, less so because they had less of a relationship, or they disagreed and, uh, and stayed in their cave. So I think that that's, that's the main thing. Uh, it's really the way um, that you can get important economic input into decision-making without the particular biases of the, of the department involved. Many of the departments of the federal government have good economists in them, uh, the Treasury, OMB, et cetera, but they come with their particular right. outlook. And so it's another way to do that. And usually, of course, you do that by speaking up for good economics, with the understanding that economics is only one input into the president's decision making, even on economic matters. There may be important things that an economist wouldn't start out with, but come to understand the president has to balance other equities as well. All right. Certainly the political pieces, policy, you know, other considerations. So uh, this is a of course, a uh, pretty uh, turbulent period in, in, in our nation's economy. Uh, the news of the day, of course, is Silicon Valley Bank, which the federal government, the FDIC, had to uh, take over recently uh, because there was effectively a run on the bank. Um, and if the White House had to watch this closely and, and, and over you know, the recent days has been figuring out what role it should take how involved should the various uh, government uh, agencies uh, deal with, with this problem? Uh, Michael Boskin, give us your take on, uh, well, first, kind of just sketch out where you think we are with Silicon Valley, ba Valley Bank. It's unusual for a regional bank to have such a, be, become a, a national story. It was the 17th largest bank in the country, or something like that. And then maybe give us some insight in terms of how the uh, policymakers and political folks inside of White House would be addressing this issue. Well, Roger, let me start with a couple of things, just the basics of Silicon Valley Bank for uh, your listeners and viewers. First of all, uh, it was a pretty large regional bank and had a couple hundred billion dollars of assets, but it had very concentrated business customers. It had lots of deposits from venture capital firms and the firms in their portfolios, the small startup firms. 
bank there, and it made lots of loans to them in the tech sector, a little bit in the healthcare sector. Uh, so it had very concentrated, uh, easy, uh, easy to look good during good times, but likely to flee more rapidly than retail depositors in their deposit base. And then it had very concentrated uh, issues in their loans and in their investments. And then, of course, when they started losing money, for example, they were, and then secondly, they mismatched their liabilities and their assets. They borrowed short term because money was very cheap for a very long time. Short term interest rates were very close to zero for most of the last 15 years. And then they went long uh, and they also invested long. For example, going into long term treasury seemed very safe. Uh, and the way the government wound up regulating their, their uh, capital was that treasuries were very safe. Uh, that may be true of very short term treasuries, but longer term treasuries were very prone to big losses if interest rates went up a lot. Mm. So they had they they violated some basic principles of finance. Most importantly, don't get too mismatched in your assets and liabilities. Number one, don't borrow short and lend long excessively. Number two, make sure you have some diversification. So undoubtedly, there's some other banks that that's a problem with. I think that big banks are very well capitalized. They have much stricter regulation. It's a separate story about what's good and bad about that. So I think it was pretty unlikely this was going to spread very far. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Fed and the FDIC, uh, undoubtedly in consultation with the White House, um, the Treasury Department, for sure, the tre Treasury Secretary has been out talking about this, decided to the FDIC closed it on a Friday and got re reorganized it, tried to strip the bad assets, tried to sell it, which apparently as of this morning it hadn't, maybe it will sometime soon, and uh, and then took the extraordinary step of guaranteeing the deposits of people who are above the limit of the FI FDIC insurance of $250,000. Uh, so that means everybody we made whole, and they seem to be indicating they're going to do that by raising fees on banks uh, that participate in the, the Fed and the FDIC system. So uh, let's go to that last part. There's a lot there to unpack, and thanks for that very clear explanation of what happened and, and the policy choices and actions that, that have been taken to date. But it seems the part that's getting a lot of attention, certainly from like a Washington policy standpoint, and is this idea that the government's going to guarantee the uninsured deposit. So anything above this threshold of $250,000. And the idea is, you know, this is the moral hazard. This is the notion that there should be consequences if people mishandle their money and then they shouldn't be bailed out. And like you just said, in characterizing the bank, Michael, these are a really kind of almost uniform uh, type of, of of client. This isn't the average American here necessarily. These are venture capitalists, which of course is entirely the risky side of of investment, um, and it's it's wealthy you know funders of, of venture capital. So, at what what would be the appropriate time for government to come in and say, hey, we're going to step in and uh, guarantee this? Is it when you think, all right, this is going to have a seismic effect across the economy? When is it appropriate and when is it not appropriate in your view? In my view, uh, it's it's unfortunately necessary when you expect there to be considerable what's called contagion. It will spread a lot and a lot of ordinary people will be hurt by that. And the reason we that was done for the big banks in 2008, or the putative reason anyway, is that it could infect the payment system. And... That's underpinning of the economy, people being able to pay each other, people being able to make their payroll, people being able to uh, pay when they make a purchase, et cetera, and that clearing through the banking system. So that, that unfortunately, is a time that has to be done, I believe. Figuring out if we've hit that point is a far more subtle and difficult issue. First, you have to decide, do we just have a liquidity problem and the Fed can add a lot of liquidity to the system, basically? The, the simplified way of saying that is printing more money and making right. that available. Uh, the second point is, uh, if, it is a, if it's an insolvency problem, is it likely to spread? And I think the odds of this spreading considerably were low, but I do think there are other banks that probably made this, these kinds of bets. And it's the inevitable result of very loose monetary policy and very, uh, very, a very big expansion of government spending. 
Uh, some of that, not all, but some of it, I think, was appropriate on humanitarian reasons during the COVID crisis. The government, it was the government that shut the economy down. And so you ha you know, there's massive unemployment and so on. Uh, we have to figure out, by the way, a way to do that better if it ever happens again, because there's so much fraud. It was a, a big embarrassment. The government, government systems just weren't ready to handle anything like that and to ferret it out fraud. Uh, that's still a problem. But so that's that's the that's the dividing line. It's not always easy. I remember when I was uh, chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, the um, high yield bond firm Drexel Burnham, uh, prominently Michael Milken was involved in these innovations. Um, were heavily financing the beginnings of the cable TV industry and the cellular telephone industry, et cetera. Those are important things, making that capital available. People were taking bigger risks. That's why they're called high yield, even sometimes junk bonds. But Jexel Burnham was in trouble. And so President Bush was getting lots of phone calls from prominent people in those industries saying, you've got to, this will spread from the high yield bond market to the regular bond market, to corporate bonds, to muni bonds, the government bonds, we have to stop it. So I got uh, the chairman of the Fed, Alan Greenspan, at the time in the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, Richard Breeden, together in my office. We threw the staffs out and uh, talked it through and just decided it was very unlikely this was going to, it was they were, they were insolvent, it was very unlikely this would spread very much. And in a couple of days, the uh, kerfuffle was over. So that, that's an, in, that, that's an, a, that's a an case, Michael, case. where where you know you looked at the, the facts that were before you at the time, and your sense was this wasn't going to be like you know contagion, wasn't going to spread. Uh, probably a tough call, right? I mean, in retrospect, it looks you know, oh, of course, but if it would have gone the other way, you know that that would have been a blot on, on on your tenure and 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 everybody else in the room. A absolutely, and that's an important point to mention, Roger. Um, you know, you have to have real realistic. Uh, understanding of the situation you also have to admit what you don't know and try to figure out what that what what uh, incoming may happen because you forgot something but it's important to have some backbone and stand up for what's right uh, because if you keep doing this you get the moral hazard you, you mentioned and every time uh, an institution a financial institution gets in trouble there's going to be an expectation that it'll be bailed out. And that means they'll start taking lots more risk because they know they can count on being bailed so, out. So uh, let's talk about that for a second, because we seem to be migrating from crisis to crisis and the big movements in our economy uh, are just that uh, some, no one could have anticipated and no one's, you know, at least in this country is no one's fault with respect to COVID. Uh, you could have argued, though, in, in 2008, if, and, and you can, the financial crisis was failure uh, uh, to regulate in the right way. Um, but this moral hazard concern, right, this, this, this point, why, how do you respond to those who say, well, no, we just need government to regulate better, right? And so we're not going to have, the way we prevent people from taking uh, unreasonable risk is because the regulators will hold them accountable. Why is that not the the a good response to to kind of the bailout culture concerns over the bailout culture we seem to find ourselves in? Well, if we could count on regulators to always do uh, more or less what's right, not to have their own incentives, uh, not to miss stuff. For example, Silicon Valley Bank is under the purview of the San Francisco Federal Reserve. Uh, and they apparently missed this. They could and should have been monitoring all of this risk. Um, in 2008-9, um, it became pretty clear to me, having had to help clean up the savings and loan crisis when I, when I was CA chair, they were having problems. And in fact, I told Secretary Paulson at a breakfast where we were kicking off corporate tax reform, and Marty Feldstein and I were the keynote speakers, um, that he should, uh, you know, he should talk to, the, to all of us who were involved in that. So we'd have some basis the next time this happened. Uh, and because we saw housing prices just soar through the roof, we saw people getting loans uh, for mortgages that couldn't get approved for a car loan. Uh, that certainly was true in California. That something would, it was much worse than I anticipated, but I thought something would happen. And so we discussed that. I went down and talked to the Undersecretary for Domestic Finance, Bob Steele. So 
but they were busy running what they're doing now. That's another problem is mm -hmm. institutional memory may not them back very far, at least among the big the people at the top making the decisions. So if you could count on them, that makes sense. But that's a real big stretch to say that you can count on the government doing the right thing. Uh, we're human beings, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, they have their own incentives, they have their own political constraints and political wishes. Um, and, you know, at the time, uh, so things were even worse than they are with inflation now, but a time when inflation was sky high and we had very high unemployment, and President Reagan famously said uh, the nine uh, most worrisome words in the English language were, I'm from the government, and I'm here to help. Right. So the government sometimes makes things worse. Sometimes it gives a very poor response to something. It's way too late, or it starts something, and then we get mission creep, and it blows way out of proportion. It's way too costly, wastes a lot of money, becomes very hard to shut down. Uh, so you have to balance those things, I think. And I think the people who always are saying, let's regulate more, have to uh, have to understand a couple of things. First, um, that we have to understand why the existing regulations didn't work. They were put in presumably by people like them earlier. <laughs> and number two, uh, what are the risks that what we do will make things worse or won't solve the problem? And I think there's too little of that. I think the worst times to make permanent policy are during a crisis, Rahm Emanuel, sorry about that, because it, things seem so horrible you, you don't see the problems out the other end that you cause or in a boom when everything seems affordable and it doesn't seem like uh, we have to worry too much about the budget uh, super interesting you know, the, the piece about silicon valley bank that you're addressing just a moment ago and and it the, the san francisco fed really has the responsibility and and if yeah, some are arguing i don't profess to have the expertise to make this claim, but others are saying it, that they should have seen this coming and, and they had it within their regulatory authority to address this. So it's, it, it almost, it's, there's an argument here, I guess, to make that regulators have the authority and, and they missed it. So it's about people actually doing the job that they have, not about um, coming up with a new construct to, to prevent this thing from coming again or to excuse, you know, a, a bailout. I think that's right. If we go back to 2008, the, financial crisis, the New York Fed had oversight, but there were holes in it. Um, for example, um, number one, we were in debates with uh, foreign company, foreign countries about how our regulation meshed with theirs because our, especially investment banks, were global and were not very much regulated at the time where our commercial banks were. They had a different system, and we had a fight over that. And so we had um, we, we allowed Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns to get huge, huge leverage, way too much debt relative to their equity, uh, 30 plus times. Right. It's ridiculous. Uh, so that was among the things that made the cause of contagion made things worse. And when you get when you get companies doing that, that are making money in the short term, it puts immense pressure on other competitors to keep up. And and so you've got to be careful about that. So definitely there are tools that were there and including insisting they diversify, increase their capital, things of that sort before this happened uh, that weren't implemented. You know, one other element you mentioned earlier, but I want you to unpack in all of this. And then I want to kind of zoom out a little bit and kind of think about how we got here in terms of macroeconomics and our uh, monetary policy and fiscal policy. But before we jump there, you made a point that Silicon Valley Bank, when there was easy money, you know, essentially zero interest, um, they 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 bought these treasuries, right? Long-term treasuries. And the regulatory environment, in some respects, based on the two thousand the 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 fix post the two thousand eight financial crisis, I understand, view that as a, a low risk activity. So, so from a regulatory standpoint, they said, okay, this bank is, has the right balance because it's holding all these treasuries. Just explain how we got that wrong because of course it totally presumed that we'd be in a zero inflationary environment. Right. And of course that changed dramatically. Absolutely. Roger, you're spot on on that. What happened was we had a very long period of very low interest rates, starting with the, the, the during and the aftermath of the financial crisis. Then we had a small increase in interest rates and then went back down again during COVID. And so it became very easy to borrow money 
at very low interest rates. Suppose you're borrowing at 1%, for example, but treasuries are yielding 3%. Well, you borrow the 1%, buy the treasury, you're making 2%. And if you leverage that up a lot, you're, you're really making a lot of money on that, uh, on a modest spread times a lot of dollars is a lot of money. So that that's part one. Part two is in the aftermath of the SNL crisis and, um, and the money center bank crisis of the early uh, early 1990s, the international regulators set up a system of risk weighting of assets that tried to make sure that banks didn't get excessively risky. And they gave, um, they put very, very um, high marks, a very safe rating to government securities, treasuries, for example. Right. And the longer you go out on the duration curve, if you buy, you know, 90, 90 day treasuries or treasuries are going to yield, are going to pay off in a few months, very little risk, even if interest rates rise. The longer you go out, the more susceptible the value of those treasuries are to rising interest rates. So if you, if you bought a bunch of long-term treasuries, 10 or 30 year treasuries, say 10 year treasuries at 3%, and interest rates rise to 6%, their value goes down. No longer lot. looking like a good investment. <laughs> that's right. And so that's a problem. Same thing happened, by the way, in the uh, on the housing side uh, beca because of uh, changes in interest rates and so on. But let's, uh, back in the financial crisis, but let's stick to Silicon Valley Bank. So now they're stuck with losses, okay? And people, they, they need to be able to pay depositors who want to withdraw their money. So they sold some, they, they sold some assets at a loss, not an unreasonable thing to do, but they hadn't raised any equity. And therefore, people started taking a look at it and said, this bank's going to be in big trouble soon. People started taking more and more money out. So ironically, it was macroeconomic policy mm. caused basically the problems in Silicon Valley Bank, in addition to their lack of diversification and the other things we mentioned earlier. What actually happened was we ran a very inflationary policy, a loose monetary policy, and a huge increase in government spending, trillions of dollars, way more than any estimate of the potential output gap, the gap between what the economy could produce and where it was. We basically flooded the economy with government spending when it was basically back to full employment. That caused a huge increase in inflation. It's still there. It's core inflation stripped out of energy and food, which we've seen go way up, and then especially energy come back down again. Uh, it's running about 5% in round numbers. Remember, President Nixon imposed wage and price controls on the economy when it got up to 4%. Mm. So this is, not, this, is, this is no joke. And we have some, some, uh, some famous people making some pretty poignant remarks about inflation. Lenin said that inflation is the way to destroy the bourgeoisie. Right. Keynes said it's the way government steals the wealth of the middle class. So... Even these people on the far left, um, Lenin, I think, wanted to use it as a device. <laughs> but these people on the left of the, of the spectrum saw the dangers of inflation. It's a very eroding thing. And one of President Reagan's, by the way, great historical accomplishments was backing Paul Volcker's disinflation. We were heading to becoming a banana republic with inflation in double digits. It had risen at every, if you compare it to the midpoint of the business cycle, every business cycle kept going up. And finally, they broke the back of that. And that wouldn't have been possible without Reagan's um, support. Uh, and that, that's an important and you talk point. about taking activity that's not politically convenient. I mean, he did this at a time knowing that it would, it, it would have, you know, the effect would be a recession. Absolutely. And you had to hold on until inflation came down and the economy can come back. And in that case, I don't think it's really disputed. Certainly, I don't think it's disputed by you or the Hoover Institution. And the economy came back with a boom. Yeah, it was a tremendous boom. Uh, you know, their political phraseology, morning again, and so on. But the, the economy grew at uh, over 5% for several years, uh, so I think 7.4% or something in 1984. So it's really important to point out that uh, when you have the courage to understand this problem, and I'll, if you want me to, I'll go back to when I first talked talking about this with Reagan in 1979. I would love to hear this. But... Um, he had the guts to do that, knowing they're going to, and indeed the Republicans got smashed in the 82 midterm elections. Right. They came back and Reagan was able to uh, win re-election easily in second term. 
I want to hear uh, your discussion with Reagan during that time because it was it was Jimmy Carter's presidency where we where you have this this inf inflation, you know, and kind of people buying homes back in the uh, late seventies, early eighties. You know, they 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 thought they were getting a deal if they were paying fourteen percent on the mortgage, right? Which is just like crazy. Anybody's bought a home in the past decade, even in this inflationary environment. But b before it, we get there, perhaps you could do it do both talk and reflect on on those conversations back in 79 but also the macroeconomic point you just mentioned we're with our guest michael boskin professor uh at the hoover institution um professor of economics i should say is it's a lot of this macroeconomics that have kind of delivered us this point in that respect silicon valley bank right is reflective of of playing out of, of almost the concerns that many like you have pointed out with this excessive government spending and you can kind of connect the dots between how all this capital in the economy is drove this inflation, which of course now in the case you've just outl outlined for us, the Silicon Valley bank and perhaps others, right. Made them what made the, they place bad bets, not knowing, you know, not, not realizing that you, this was all going to be this conduct, these macroeconomic uh, developments were going to have an inflationary impact on our economy. So, I mean, 79 was, 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 was a particularly acute moment. Talk, take us about that and, and, and how macroeconomics as a whole really do impact uh, and spending as conservatives talk about really does have this drag on the economy eventually. Yeah, you eventually have to pay for the inflation. Unfortunately, the people who are paying for it tend to be people, lower income and lower middle income and middle income people. Uh, but let's go back to 1979, 1980. That's when President Reagan was elected in the 1980 election. And in 1979 and 80, we had what was called stagflation, the first time that was ever used, high inflation and high unemployment simultaneously. Um, there was an old model of uh, Keynesian economics that was popular at the time. Um, I think Nixon even said we're all Keynesians now at one point, but basically it was a center left uh, and in Keynes to Keynes defense, it wasn't far left. It was center left. It got abused, but um, uh, in the political process, it got abused. But um, the argument was there was a stable trade off between inflation and unemployment. Inflation got too high. You could cool it off with higher interest rates by the Fed and uh, and, and less less expansive uh, fiscal policy. And that might lead to some unemployment increase. And you could figure that out pretty quickly. That, that view had been intellectually demolished by Milton Friedman and uh, Ned Phelps of Columbia uh, in saying that's really not the way the economy works, that you'll wind up, you can't permanently reduce unemployment by running an inflationary economy. It'll keep going up. And that seemed to fit the facts of the 70s much better. And, uh, but here we were with uh, an expansionary policies by Jimmy Carter uh, the Fed had, under Arthur Burns, had kept expanding the economy on the money supply and drove inflation up. And so we had stagflation. Uh, people may remember, or your older brother or sister may remember, something called the misery index, the sum of the inflation and unemployment rate, which President Reagan, then candidate Reagan, used very effectively in the campaign. So we had this horrible inflation. I mean, we're talking about double-digit inflation, roughly double where it is now as bad as it is now. And we had spending that was uh, not under control. Importantly, and this is another important achievement of President Reagan, the tax system wasn't indexed for inflation. So you may have a 10% inflation, and if your wages go up 5%, you, you go into a higher tax bracket on top of losing that 5%. Uh, so it was pretty miserable, a pretty miserable time for many Americans. And then um, the argument was, we uh, by the left, that the government had to regulate things a lot more, that the way to stop this would be for the government to set an incomes policy and get labor unions and businesses together and agree about wages and prices. So a lot more economic planning, a lot more government involvement in the economy. President Reagan saw that as a big problem. At a dinner at George Shultz's home in 1979, where George invited several economists, myself, Milton Friedman, uh, from the business school here, Ezra Solomon, a couple others, we were there talking about inflation and supply side economics primarily. And, and Milton, of course, was uh, in the vanguard against uh, high inflation. And President Reagan totally agreed. He asked a few penetrating questions, how long would this take and stuff like that. And then I got to push on supply side economics, which I had something on the intellectual side to get going by my work and 
saving and investment. And he gave, he shocked me the sophisticated answer he gave, which was tax rates can get too high. He said, I saw that in Hollywood, where back in the days of really high tax rates, where people wouldn't make films or they go somewhere else to make films to avoid the taxes, et cetera, um, that we wouldn't collect even, even collect any additional revenue that the rates had to be higher on a tax on something that was very uh, responsive to taxes, maybe not so much on cigarettes, for example. But um, but people keep missing. And this is Reagan pointing this out to me, which of course is exactly academically correct. That as you go headed toward that, eventually you get less and less revenue, and eventually you turn down. So you're you're you know part way up that hill. You're not doing very well when you keep raising trying to try, raise more money. Um, so in any event, he committed uh, to Milton that he was serious about inflation, and I was over the moon about what he had to say about supply-side economics, right. despite what other people tried to put words in his mouth, and um, we can get to that when we talk about the book. Um, but in any event, uh, he, he carried through. He had he indexed the tax code for inflation so people weren't just being driven into, into the higher tax rates just because of inflation. We still have some real bracket creep if you're if you go up more if your wages, for example, go up more than inflation, you can go into a higher tax bracket. He um uh he stuck by Paul Volcker, and without that support, including this recession you indicated, a deep recession, unemployment got up to 10%. Uh, there never would have been a disinflation. And we got back to something that was more or less manageable. The economy started to grow. Uh, he was able to uh, do some other things at that time period as well. But these were just hugely historically important, uh, important policy changes that dramatically improved the economy and led it to what economists tend to call the great moderation. Hmm. Quarter century where we had very few, very mild recessions and, uh, and mostly st strong, stable economy with Relatively low inflation, uh, only rarely a modest increase in unemployment. Uh, so uh, I would yeah, that balance, you know, from the mid '80s going through, you know. Yeah, we've had ups and downs since then, and you know, we've kind of slid a little bit too far away from what he did, but there's still a strong influence. Tax rates would be a lot higher now if it wasn't for him, for example. And now we're dealing with inflation again, and I think the lessons we learned earlier still hold today. So let, let's talk about today and love that reflection and, and, and kind of the approach and actually doing the, the, the hard political choice, the, the inconvenient thing politically, uh, which ultimately uh, President Reagan was rewarded for, as you point out, uh, by the time he was up uh, for the second term. But certainly that first midterm, uh, he, he paid the price. But today we're having this Silicon Valley Bank, you know, fail the run on the bank. We're going to see what this quote unquote bailout looks like this time. Of course, the macroeconomic picture, you have the Biden administration released last week as top line budget spending going up there, particularly on the domestic side, significantly for many government agencies. And then, of course, we'll have a debt ceiling crisis in the not too distant future. The Treasury Department's doing all the special maneuvers to delay it as long as possible. And we have a Republican House of Representatives with a Republican Speaker of the House focused on reducing spending with the Senate democratic controlled is not. And the president of course, his budget is what the Senate will want to support. Michael Boskin, tell us how this is going to figure into uh, the inflationary environment uh, you were just speaking about. And of course, this is the most immediate crisis uh, with the Silicon Valley bank. Well, the problem is that a $6.8 trillion budget and $5 trillion of tax hikes almost 4.7 or 8 over the next 10 years is bad news for the economy. It's really bad news. And these taxes are all on capital formation, uh, not all, but heavily, raising the top tax rate, which, by the way, is raising the top tax rate on successful small businesses, which pay taxes on the same 1040 form you and I use, Roger, and uh, doubling the capital gains tax. What they don't seem to get, in my opinion, is these aren't just taxes on the rich. We can have a separate argument about that, about whether that makes sense. But they're taxes on becoming rich. They're reducing the incentive to work hard, invest, save, innovate, say, et cetera, work overtime, build that business, um, because you're going to pay a lot more in taxes out the other end. 
And that's really important. The, thing, the single most important thing that drives the economy here or anywhere else is the incentives of people to try to get ahead. And combined with some of this other stuff we see in society, trying to attack meritocracy, trying to equilibrate down and things of that sort, that's really insidious and that's potentially dangerous. But getting back to Biden's budget, it would be quite inflationary uh, if it passed. I think it's not going to pass. Republicans in the House won't go along with all these tax hikes. Um, and while there may be an occasional agency that makes sense to increase somewhat, uh, most of these are... Um, more or less culture kinds of things that are not likely to produce a whole bunch more uh, in output and incomes for Americans. So that's the big problem, and it'll make it harder to keep inflation under control, either if there is a lot more spending than is currently anticipated. Uh, that should be scaled back slowly over time. But also, um, if it's even anticipated, that could spook financial markets at some point. So... I think the Bi people have described the Biden budget as dead on arrival. Let's hope so. But eventually it's going to have to be a negotiation. Or we'll have what are called continuing resolutions. They won't pass the 12 appropriations bills, or most of them. The, they may have to wind up in well, with the horror we've had for the last decade of big omnibus bills that are agreed to leadership level without much input from the committees of jurisdiction that have more knowledge about what what ought to be done. Uh, so just to pick up where you, you kind of summarize where you are and then ask you one follow-up, right? So your prediction, given the, the House is controlled by Republicans, we're not going to see the Biden proposals in, on, on, in terms of tax increases play out. That has to originate from the House. That won't happen there. The budget proposal, of course, uh, won't see the increases that the Biden administration has requested, certainly on the non-defense side, because Republicans are there as well. Uh, all that suggests that we'll be in a continuing resolution and kind of keep spending at a, a similar or close to the same level as a previous fiscal year. But there's one other X factor here, Michael, which is this debt ceiling and what that might churn out. Republicans just takes a few of them, uh, you know, to to bring something down. Uh, it's such a narrow majority in the House of Representatives. Many of them don't want to see uh they want to use the debt ceiling to ensure that spending is not just staying at current levels, but goes down to a previous fiscal year, pick your year, you know, tw fiscal year 22 or something else. I guess two questions on that, Michael, how do you see that playing out? You've, you've, you've watched this and lived this for a long time. Um, and then second, how does it impact the economy overall when we're in these debt ceiling dramas? Well, if it turns out to be short lived, it'll just wash out. You know, it'll be, there'll be a big kerfuffle. There may be some, you know, a couple of bad days on the stock market, the bond market, whatever it happens to be, and that may, that may spur them to get some compromise. Uh, the Treasury has some additional uh, ways it can handle, in addition to these special things it's been doing. In the end, if it's forced to for a short period, it could prioritize paying the interest on the debt and delay payments to vendors. That, for example, is what California has done traditionally in its budget crises. They issue what are called revenue anticipation notes or things of that sort. But um, hopefully we won't get there. Hopefully they'll be able to sit down. And I think the most constructive thing that could come out of this would be to set up a process where we have a group, including members of both parties and outside experts, sit down and really go through the budget item by item and get back to something like the Simpson Bowles Commission did where everything was on the table. And a commitment to that process would maybe allow them to at least temporarily raise the debt ceiling and see what was come up with and whether something sensible could, could show up that could get a majority through. That might not work. Simpson Bowles had some pretty good recommendations, lower flatter tax rates on a broader base, starting to slow the growth of entitlement spending, a few other things of that sort. But President Obama yanked the rug on it. He appointed yeah. them, and then he yanked the rug on it. He said, no, thank you on that one. It, 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 yeah, that same thing could happen again. But And, you know, I understand, and I have some sympathy with spending being so much out of control, uh, some sympathy for trying to use the, the debt ceiling but, to force something. That's what I was going to ask you. I mean, you, you know, this is a you know, kind of full faith and credit clause <laughs> You know, it's kind of at risk here and and institutionalists and conservatives in the true meaning of the world don't want to see us 
walking away from that. And on the other hand, Truly. it's like the only forcing function uh, people can point to to in this era, you know, this moment of divided government to try to get a concession. And and maybe just before we get to our lightning round and and conclude our conversation, Michael, in the context of using the debt ceiling to drive some sort of negotiation like this and this kind of high stakes uh, kind of game of chicken between political parties over our spending. You're someone who also advocates looking at entitlement spending, which of course is the true driver uh, in terms of government spending and, and, and growth in government spending that and these kind of emergency spending measures we've seen uh, in the recent past. Absolutely. Uh, virtually all the growth in government debt will be due to the growth of entitlement spending, Social Security and Medicare. Some of that makes sense, but there are ways to perhaps reform those programs gradually, not affecting people who are retired or soon to retire over time so that it gradually is implemented, phased in. We did that in 1983, remember the Social Security Amendments, which, for example, raised the retirement age, but it didn't start for 20 years or so. And then for one period, for it raised it two months a year for six years, so brothers or sisters wouldn't wind up paying different, being different, treated differently. And then it had a pause, and then again. So this was in the distant future. It was a really good reform. Uh, the, there's the problems in Social Security as long-run finances would be much greater had we not done that. But life expectancy has continued to go up. Yeah, it's, I was going to say that. It's like the be it's the most obvious piece. I mean, the life expectancy alone has changed so dramatically. The whole Social Security construct should adjust to it, no? I mean, <laughs> absolutely. Well, you know, these programs were enacted in different under different economic and demographic conditions, and there certainly are ways to do this that should be uh, could be done with very little pain and none to people who are already retired or soon to retire. And right now, Social Security in about a decade, a little over a decade, is supposed to only be able to pay 77 cents on the dollar. We don't want that, especially if we really depend on Social Security. Uh, so the fact that President Biden kind of forced the Republicans into saying they're not going to cut Social Security in the State of the Union is, I think, very irresponsible. And a true leader would take try to take a crack at this and see what sensibly could be done. President Reagan did that. Did he love every part of this, this thing? Probably not. But he got some important improvements made, and it better it better the country. You yeah, take eighty percent of it's available to you, and that clearly was the way he governed. And he was certainly no admirer of of Social Security, as you know uh, from the Hoover Institution. Uh, scholars there, uh, Martin and Anderson, Marty Anderson, and Lisa Anderson, along with Kyron Skinner, put together Reagan in his own hand, pulling up the old radio dresses. I mentioned that because I was listening to one from nineteen seventy eight when Reagan was. Uh, telling his listeners or reading to his listeners the original Social Security Act and how it was supposed to work. And between, I think, 1933 and 1934, when it started, to 1978 during that recording, he was pointing out how you know, dramatically it expanded and uh, what a what a poor financial situation it was in. And, and he had been called out, I think, Mike, you probably remember this, uh, in 1976 for, for saying it was going to be trillions of dollars, you know, behind and they said he was making up those numbers, and he read a report on this radio sh uh, on, his, on his radio show uh, in 1978 saying it was actually not a trillion; it was three trillion dollars. You probably recall that one. <laughs> oh, I do, and I remember uh, when we were prepping him for his debate we were in this farmhouse in Virginia. I was it was me and uh, Gene Kirkpatrick and George Will were asking the questions, and I asked him a question on Social Security, and there were three things he was were the highlights. And that was one of them. And uh, he nailed it, you know. So I think that, uh, you know, we have the courage to do this. It was a third rail until it wasn't. And a true leader would say, we're going to have to deal with that. We're going to have to get everybody on board. We're not going to affect people who are already retired. But, you know, back then, uh, when it was enacted, FDR said the mission of Social Security is to, uh, is to assure, uh, uh, assure our elderly won't be living in poverty. Today, if you've been pay paying in at the high end of the of the maximum, you know, one hundred fifty thousand dollars now, but thirty, forty, fifty along the way as it's adjusted for inflation, um, you would get twice the poverty rate in your benefits so, uh, as a single individual, and if you had a two hundred couple between the two of you, likewise. So it's really it's really gone beyond the original mission, and um, 
over some over some time, we're going to have to do something about it. Uh, and it would be a good thing if we got together and got a sustainable policy like Reagan did in 1983 with uh, with uh, the Dems who controlled Congress at the time. And and that would wind up inuring to the benefit of the whole country without harming the elderly. Yeah. Could you imagine a time when your leader get up in the State of the Union and, and you have members on both sides of the aisles applaud a common sense reform that would put us in a in – a, you know, make a rich country, so making sure that will remain rich for years to come by by doing the sensible thing like this. Um, that would be a welcome relief. Let me also say a big problem with the continuing resolution part is uh, with inflation, the Biden budget or last year is going to really hit the defense budget. And while there are some savings we need to do in defense, we need a larger defense budget. We, we need a, lo- a better defense. We're, we're too small. Uh, we're, we're not aligned exactly properly with where the risks are. Uh, we have a lot we have to do. Some of that's going to have to come from shutting down things that aren't that important and some ref- efficiencies. We're going to have to be spending more on defense to get to the defense we need. Well, Michael, I appreciate your leadership on that. And you were kind enough to have me out at a conference at the Hoover Institution not too long ago talking about just that subject. And I, I especially appreciate just listeners and viewers know from my background is in the world of, of national defense and a, an eminent economist like yourself, a person who's thoughtful on domestic policy ha- also has what I think are the spot on right instincts on national defense policy too. And I, I couldn't agree with you more in terms of those set of observations you just shared. Well, thanks Roger. Let's go to our lightning round. And we've had some really good, uh, uh, Reagan recalls here with our guest, Michael Boskin from the Hoover institution. Uh, But this is where we ask all our guests to share uh, their favorite book on President Reagan, favorite Reagan speech, and favorite Reagan quote. Michael Boskin, you can give us all three, two, or just one. What do you have for us today? Well, the favorite book is something you mentioned before. It's actually a series of books that Martin and Annalise Anderson wrote, one or two with Kyron Skinner, which got to the truth about Reagan from his own writings, from his own speeches, I'm looking at his handwritten notes, um, uh, getting ready for his uh, radio show on G Theater and so on TV. Uh, that I think really is vital for three reasons. First, it corrects the historical record, and the left has always been trying to paint President Reagan as just this, you know, person who would read the lines and so on. He was much deeper than that. He was a serious person and really studied these issues. He had he had his own opinions he formed based on that study, um, but he studied those issues, and I think that's really important. It also um, gives you a firsthand account of what he was thinking along the way. You mentioned that earlier when you talk about his uh, remarks on Social Security, uh, and I think that's really important. And third, I think it puts up a roadblock to continued uh, to co- continued inaccurate attacks on Reagan and the Reagan administration. Uh, it was Senator Moynihan who said, um, you're entitled to your opinion, but you're not entitled to your separate facts. <laughs> and that's really important. So so I love that book, and I actually had a book party for them when they released it. And uh, so that's my favorite book on Reagan. There are many others. Um, uh, I wrote one on Reaganomics, uh, but uh, that had far fewer viewers and less important. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll make sure to, to promote that one here. Michael Boskin. Oh, go ahead. In his speech, uh, I think that my favorite has to be Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. Uh, It just encapsulated so much, so well. It was a very strong statement of principle about freedom, about, um, you know, he earlier called them the evil empire and so on. And I think he sensed that opportunity and eventually wound up happening. And then if you ask me for my favorite quote, quote, Megan, I have to repeat, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. (laughs) <laughs> now, my own views, I think, are, you know, 80, 90 percent congruent with President Reagan's. I would differ a little bit here and there around the margins. Sure. But the basic story is we should think of the government as the last resort to solving a problem, not the first. And we've gotten into the habit these days of as soon as there's a problem, the government should step in without giving much thought to whether it's actually going to be a cure that's better than that's going to actually cure the disease. Great quote, uh, great uh, book suggestions. Michael Boskin of the Hoover Institution, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure, Roger. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Reaganism. New episodes premiere weekly every Monday on YouTube and all podcast streaming platforms. If you like this episode, be sure to let us know and share with a friend. 